All right. Well, you know what? It is uh, it is five o'clock on the West Coast here, so we're going to kick off the uh, the meetup for today. So welcome, everyone, to the uh, Thursday, August 24th edition of the Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Um, we're going to uh, to get into uh, into Reed's ugly baby story in, uh, in just a little bit here. But um, before we do that, uh, we're just going to go through and do our, our normal normal of everything that, uh, that we do here. So we're going to start, of course, by thanking the sponsors, uh, SkillWave, which is uh, the training company that I run with Matt Allington, where if you want to learn some awesome uh, Power BI and Excel skills, you should definitely go and check this out. Uh, Reed also has a course on SkillWave that you should check out on data visualization. Um, well worth mm -hmm. it. We've got some great stuff there. Uh, Excel Guru is the parent company of SkillWave and also the producer of the Monkey Tools add-in. And if you haven't checked that out and you're building data models in Excel or using Power Query, you definitely should. Our next Excel meetup is coming up. I'm super excited to be welcoming, welcoming uh, Carlos Barboza to our um, to our platform. Uh, he's been a, a longtime attendee of ours, and he's uh, a recent MVP graduate or um, um, MVP award winner. Uh, so he's going to be coming to talk about tips and tricks for interactive charts with dynamic arrays. So that should be pretty cool. And um, our next Power BI track, uh, for reference on this one, we're working on this one. Um, we have our speaker. We're just trying to confirm some details with it. So as soon as we have that done, including you will notice the time is to be announced here, uh, we will have all those details uh, come out here. Um, but uh, in the meantime, just know that it'll be something cool and awesome by somebody awesome. So be aware of that and just watch for the RSVPs to open. Uh, just a quick note on Monkey Tools. Um, we, I actually have been doing some work on this thing uh, recently again. I released uh, some new updates yesterday. Um, we have done some further updates to the smart file and smart folder queries and monkeys. Uh, we now allow you to connect to the connector.files and connector.contents, uh, which means that you can build much faster solutions than uh, Microsoft's defaults, and it's super easy to switch. You just switch a true or a false parameter, and it will switch between the two of them. And of course, it automatically smart switches between local files and SharePoint files without any worry and hassle of trying to use the wrong connector. Uh, the big change on this one here is that in addition to smart folder being listed here, we also have smart file. Um, we've done some big uh, upgrades to that as well. So if you're working um, in a consulting capacity, you're building something on your local computer, you need to zip up your solution, send it to somebody else on the other side, and you have no idea where they're going to put it, whether it's a local file or a SharePoint piece. Hey, well, you know what? If it's an Excel file, a, a PDF, a JSON, a whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, we've got a solution for those to be uh, dynamically path as well, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, we've also added a bunch of function documentation to FN get parameter, FN smart file, FN smart folder. They look super professional now. It's uh, kind of scary. Uh, anyhow, so that's some cool stuff that's come out in Monkey Tools. Um, my Excel Fundamentals Bootcamp is starting up again on September 13th. If you are looking for some good training for you or your team to get your fundamentals of Excel right, uh, things from pivot tables and data visualizations and formulas and Power Query, um, that program is, uh, is available. It's fantastic. You should definitely check it out. Um, this is the ideal program really for people who want to get their pivot tables and, and formula and reporting skill knowledge up to uh, snuff at a basic level and prepare yourself for deeper analysis later on. All of these links, by the way, are included in the slide deck that is posted at the Meetup site. Um, and if anybody wants any individual ones, please just you know message me in the chat, and I'm happy to drop them in there as well. Our self-service BI bootcamp, we've actually, uh, for our live editions of this, we've actually um, switched our dates out a little bit. We've pushed them back a bit. We got some feedback that uh, trying to do this so close to summer was, was not going to work, so people would prefer later in the year. So we are going to be looking at running a three-day uh, self-service BI bootcamp in person from October 31st to November 2nd in Boston, Massachusetts. And on the Friday, there is an optional um, additional one-day data visualization in Excel with John Peltier, my good friend, that's going to be leading that. And then we're going to be doing it again in Portland, November 28th to 30th and uh, December 1st for John's portion as well. If you're interested in joining us for that, we'd love to have you. These live boot camps are always a blast. Um, and you, in addition to that, get access to the entire um, you know, online version of my self-service BI program to go with that as well to, to back end it so that you know, once you've done your three days of drinking from the fire hose, you still have an option to go back and actually, you know, watch things a little bit slower later on and revisit the uh, the salient points. Joseph's laughing because he's been to one of my boot camps and he knows that we give you a lot of information in these things. So um, if you're interested, here's another slide on uh, on this one here and just a quick summary on it uh, you can find here as well. Uh, we also have the online versions. If you don't have the time for in-person, that's cool. Um, we have online versions of this as well that you can, uh, can access at any time. Uh, the last, uh, well, 
penultimate kind of thing kind of thing I've got here though is um, that our home for our Van Pug meetup recordings. Of course, every single meetup is recorded. We post it live or post it to the Skillwave YouTube uh, channel. Um, I will notify everybody once it's up via the meetup link. You'll get a nice little notification there that says, "Hey, it's available," and um, at that point, it'll be ready to go. If you like some shorter type. Bite-sized learning, we have our monkey shorts videos, three minutes or less of technical content. Some of the ones we're featuring right now are adding slicers to cube formulas and actually making your cube formulas a little more efficient, as well as the best way to keep your Power BI desktop current. Earlier today, I was chatting with one of my students who's still using a version of Power BI desktop from 2021. I was like, ouch, yeah, yeah, that does make you wince, doesn't it? That's, uh, that's old. So um, anyhow, this is the easiest way to actually make sure that it's gonna stay up to date for you. The last thing that I'm going to say on this one here is that we're always looking for new speakers. If you'd like to come and try your hand at speaking at Van Pug, we would love to have you. Or if you're a you know practiced hat at speaking, we'd love to have you too. Just fill out this little survey here, get in touch with us, and we will get you on our stage. And on that note, I'm like a minute longer than I usually go. Joseph, I got to get off the stage and make room for you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All so right. let me stop sharing my screen here. And uh, very excited to uh, to once again be uh, welcoming Joseph back for this this month's round of what's new in Power BI. And I'm trying to think, do we have a build for you on this one? Uh, we do, as of two days ago. So oh, sweet. So plenty plenty of time to look and 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 research and do all sorts of cool stuff. So yeah, fantastic. There you go. All right. So so yeah, th thank you, Ken. Welcome everyone to the August. Can't believe it's the end of August already. Uh, 2023 uh, Vancouver Power BI Meetup Group. Uh, as as Ken said, my name is my name is Joseph. I do the What's New in Power BI uh, almost every month uh, before the the feature speaker at the Meetup Group here. So so yeah, we had a new release uh, two days ago um, for for the August release of the Power BI Desktop app. Uh, and as always, one of the places that I start uh, when when there is a feature release is the feature summary blog post by Microsoft. Uh, so as always, all the all the either brand new functionality or functionality that's in preview or functionality that maybe previously was in preview and is now generally available uh, it is all outlined in the table of contents here uh, and separated into these uh, different sections depending on what part of the tool they relate to. Uh, so, so for today, I'm going to focus on the three up here in the reporting section. Uh, I usually do focus on the reporting section for sort of my favorite uh, new features or updated functionality to preview. Um, but, but there, there has been a lot of cool stuff this month. Um, update to the DAX order by function that came out uh, last month or maybe the month before, uh, and then lots of uh, custom visualizations in the marketplace as well. Uh, but to start, I'm gonna I'm I'm just gonna stick to this reporting section. Uh, and the first update that, that I think is pretty cool is the new layout switch switcher in Power BI. So if I just head into Power BI here, uh, you may see in the bottom left hand corner now we have two icons. So we have a desktop layout view, and just next to it we have a mobile layout view. So if I toggle to to the other view. We can see that I've already started building and designing my report page for mobile. So if anyone uh, is using the Power BI mobile app to consume the report that I'm designing, we have an idea of what exactly it's going to look like. So I've added just a few things here, but I can also uh, drag other visuals from my page from this pane on the right hand side. And we can just drag it, make it bigger or smaller. Uh, change the order of these things uh, so we can really closely control exactly how our report looks and renders on mobile. Uh, and what's great about this update is having these icons right here pretty much on the report canvas. Uh, previously, if I just go back into uh, the desktop view for a second, these uh, th this page view was was here in the view tab. So besides just controlling the actual size of the report canvas and the page, uh, it was this mobile layout button here, this icon on the ribbon that would toggle between the two. And if you didn't know where it is, it wasn't always obvious what you were looking for or even what this did. So now it's like right down here on the bottom next to all the other report pages. Uh, and I think this is a great update and it really keeps top of mind those folks who may be consuming your reports on mobile. So I think I think this is a 
just one of those quick wins that I think makes the makes the application even better to use. Uh, if I just head back into the into the uh, blog post, oh. uh, right here. Uh, so, so that was my first favorite feature. The new is the, my second one was looking at the new options for uh, scaling our our bubbles in our scatter plots. Uh, so. So there's uh, two new. So there's two new options. We have a magnitude option now and a data range option. Uh, and and just reading the blog post gave a good little bit of a summary. Um, but one thing I found is the actual scatter bubble and dot plot charts documentation page. So not the blog post for the feature summary, but the actual documentation for this type of visual um, was updated as well. And this gave a little bit more insight for me into exactly what these new settings for the uh, range scaling of the bubbles in a chart are. So we now have magnitude and data range. So data range sizes the bubbles and a scatter plot from the smallest data value, uh, whether that's a positive or a negative value, just the smallest number all the way up to the largest number. And it scales the size of those bubbles based on the scale of that range uh, or based on the range of your data. Magnitude, on the other hand, uh, converts negative numbers into positive numbers, and then all the bubbles are sized just by their absolute value, essentially. So we see here any negative values for sizing are converted to positive values with the same magnitude. So the bubbles scale from zero to the maximum magnitude, whether that's um, a positive or a negative number, just taking the absolute value. So what this looks like, if I go to my on object tab in my report, uh, I do have a, a scatter chart already created here. And if I just pull up the formatting pane on the right hand side under markers. Uh, actually, let's see, do I have? Uh, I do have a side under markers. We see, let's get rid of this. Let's head back mean balance and go to all on the series and now in range scaling on the right hand side here we can see that we have this magnitude option and this data range and both of these are going to look exactly the same for me because i don't have any negative values um i don't have any negative values within within this mean balance measure which is driving the size of my bubbles uh, so so in this instance it's going to it's going to look the same but we still have some all the other options available to us like just making sort of that base size of the of the bubbles, how big we want that to appear. I think the default's usually around negative 10 or something like that. So so now we have a little bit more control over exactly how we want um, this the range scaling of the bubbles on our scatter plot to be. Uh, and so then my my last favorite update from this month are updates to this on object functionality. So on object, as I've covered for the last few uh, what's new in Power BI is the ability to, to define the, the fields that populate our visual, as well as some of the formatting options directly on the visual itself. This is on object formatting, and this looks really similar to some of the formatting that we see in Excel for, for Excel charts. Uh, so it really makes the experience between both tools a little bit more similar, uh, and it definitely makes it easier to sort of iterate more quickly as you're building or formatting your visuals. So, so one of the first updates, uh, and if you have sharp eyes, you may have seen already, but we now have the ability to, to drag and widen uh, and, and narrow the actual on object pane. Uh, this wasn't possible before. So now if we have uh, really long field names for some of our DAX measures, or even just some of the, uh, the field names in our data model, um, we're now able to see this in, in, its, in, in, in its entirety. So I have short field names, so I can collapse that down a little bit more. Uh, and, and another update as well is that previously, once the uh, visual size was getting close to the bottom right hand corner here uh, like that, now we see that it's these, this on object is a little bit smarter about using all of the report pane. Previously, it would sort of shrink down and you'd have a little scroll bar. But now, no matter how we size our visual on our report page, we have a little bit of a scroll bar there, but we're getting a lot more. Here we go. And we're now seeing essentially all of that on object pane, uh, no matter how we size the visual or where it is in the report, which, which is great. And it just makes it easier to see all the options that we have available to us as well.
Uh, the last cool little uh, little update, which again is probably more of a quick win, is if I go into focus mode, which is when we're just focusing on one visual from our report canvas, we're just looking just at one visual. Uh, if I wanted to go and if I hit the ellipsis here to start formatting it, uh, and what this format mode allows us to do is just click on a specific part of a visual and we're automatically on the format pane uh, driven to that specific area to format. So if I wanted to format the legend, if I click on the legend, we see here that we we pop up in this legend area. If I go to the legend title, this title box uh, expands. And same thing if I click on any of these series. Um, when we're in focus mode, so when we're sort of drilled in just to one visual and we're start and we're entered into this format mode here, it can be difficult to see previously if we were in format mode or not. So now when we enter it, we see we have this end format mode button appears on the top. So we know that we are formatting if you know things are looking weird or we forget that that's what we were doing. Now we can just end format mode, go back to our report. Uh, and and we're ready to we're ready to rock and move on with with further developing and designing our report page. Uh, so so with that, I think those those are my three favorite updates or or uh, well yeah I guess three favorite updates from this month's feature summary for August. Uh, we had the new layout switcher between mobile and and desktop view, the new bubble range scaling setting uh, between magnitude and data range. Uh, and then finally, again, some more updates to that on object formatting pane. Uh, I think every month, at least for the next couple of months, um, there's going to continue to be updates to on object uh, formatting, and I'll probably continue to to showcase them because I, I really like this feature. Uh, but with that, I think that's that's pretty much my time, and I'm happy to pass it back to Ken, pass it back to Reed uh, to get started with the feature presentation tonight. So. Thank you, everyone, and and looking forward to the main session. Awesome, thanks, Joseph. Uh, Joseph, um, I, I'm guessing you probably showed this last month, but one of my favorite features recently was with Miguel Myers and the digital to come out with that new spline or the the curved line on the line chart, which it's yeah, just, it from like day one in Power BI, like I had been just begging her to smooth their line than the Jaga one. So it's like that quick, like just turning that into this smooth line is just it's so beautiful. Why was that not there? From uh, if you go to um, uh, go, go down line type and change that to smooth. Here, yeah, yep. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, just it just that those, those curved it like it's just I I love that so much. Like I real <laughs> like every other every other visualization tool has a smoother line except for Power BI. And like when this finally was out, I just it made me so happy that I didn't have to go to custom visuals anymore to get this. Absolutely. Yeah, sometimes it's just the little things. <laughs> See, that's funny because as a purist, I'm like, no, give me the pointy ones. <laughs> <So> <laughs> but it's, you know what? I love so the fact that better. we got options, right? Like that's, yeah, that's, the, that's exactly. the cool thing. Exactly. And I mean, and so. technically we've had that join type, like there, there's the round, the midter, but the the level of, um, you have to basically zoom in on a 4K monitor, monitor to even notice the differences of the of the tips of the mm. of those. Like it, it is imperceptible. Um, when when you actually change those, like on your pointed line, you'll actually notice a teeny tiny bevel if you if you observe the two pixels that actually get rounded on a typical 1080p <laughs> screen. But uh, joint tab's pretty much useless for the most part. <laughs> yeah, not not super worried on that part. So awesome. Well, thanks, Joseph. I uh, appreciate it once again. Um, always awesome. a, a great job on it and uh, fantastic. A quick summary for today. So, um, all right. Well. Now I guess we'll uh, we'll turn the uh, the presentation over to Reed. Who uh, I got to say, if there's one thing I can count on Reed for, it's when we ask him for a presentation title, he's going to come back with something that is uh, entertaining. So, Reed, um, I hear you've got an ugly baby you want to tell us about. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the it's, floor uh, is yours. <laughs> exactly. So uh, let me go ahead and kick on the screen share and a few others here, and yes. So basically fixing a bad report and ugly baby. So I will pop this picture here. Oh, here we go. Done and do full screen. Here the full. Get this up. Yeah, fixing a bad report slash ugly baby. It is something that uh, I think a lot of us have dealt with before. Um, I, I went around a few different titles. It was ugly baby, hot potato. Overall, it's like, what are the things that we've, 
that I've come across as patterns that I've seen when a file is given to me. And as a consultant, and you know, Ken's probably in, in, been in similar scenarios where there, there's a degree of you're handed a project, and sometimes the client's just like, you know what? We know that it's it's good enough, but it could be better. Well, what needs to be better? We don't really know, but we do know that it needs to be faster, better, smaller, and optimized. Uh, but you you have to figure it out on your own what that is. Like that, from an external consultant perspective, we deal with that. From an internal perspective, there's those you come into a role, you switch departments, or just somebody moves out of a position, and you're given you're given an object, or in this case, a Power BI file with with little to no. Um, documentation, oftentimes none, and it's just make this better. So there, there's a degree of uh, kind of a story that's being told on this. Like, what are the things that I look for? This is something that can very easily be a four-hour conversation. I can boil it down to 30 minutes, but uh, I have a lot of um, patterns that I've noticed over the years from, from fixing up the stuff. So I'm very much a visualization guy, so I want to go a little bit into kind of who I am um, a bit and talk about that, uh, where I come from, because uh, I'm going to start from this presentation um, from the reporting and design perspective. Uh, and also, Ken, just because I'm traveling, I normally have a second monitor with like times and everything, but if you want to give me a like a 10 minute and a five minute just reminder to make sure I'm, I'm honest on the uh, time frames and everything, that'd be great. Um, I'm, but with I'm, this, honest, I'm honestly not super worried about it, Reed. I mean, take take as long as you need for the presentation and um, it, it's all good to go, unless you need me to cut you off, but... Um. <laughs> Mm, I'd say yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to keep it to about an hour. So if you notice me at like an hour 20 and I'm still just, just going for momentum, maybe then just be like, give me a gentle nudge. But I, I'm, I'm <laughs> no pretty worries. good. I usually keep myself in check. Um, but yeah, Done I've deal. been in this. Perfect. I've been in this space probably, it doesn't feel like that long, but it's been about 11 years now. Um, and I have started back with uh, Excel Power View. That I used to always in trainings have, have like a raise of hands. Like who here is, uh, has... Um, has used Power View and Excel, and it used to be a good number of hands, but it's less and less every year. Ken, I'm I'm sure you're very familiar with that in, in the Silverlight platform that it was built on. But essentially, yes. I, I started working with Power BI when it was Power View. It was the grandfather. It was pretty. It looked cool. It was slow as molasses, and it was it was a very um, today archaic thing. But it had small multiples and all the other fancy stuff. But as I evolved with the platform, I just levered, noticed myself leaning more and more into visualization and design, uh, hence kind of the nickname that you see here with, uh, with the VizWiz, where it's, um, I think it was, uh, Mike Carla might have been the one to give me that name, um, but it kind of is my niche and my specialty that I do my YouTube videos on a lot. I'm an end-to-end -end developer. I do everything fairly well in Power BI, but uh, I, I really enjoy visualization and design. So that's kind of where I'm going to tackle the story to begin with. It's the reporting layer, because that's a layer that I think often is lacking a lot of love. There's a lot of great data models out there. There's a lot less good reports built off of those data models, I'd say, um, at the end of the day. So uh, time permitting, I'm going to go through a lot of scenarios, kind of both two halves of a coin. What is a, a best practice, but also what is a pitfall to avoid? in this. And I have a kind of a file built out that has a lot of things that I broke, uh, but I want to explore the journey of the uh, the things that you can do to help fix up um, items if you are ever given, you know, that hot potato or the ugly baby that needs to be cleaned up and fixed and with very little to no requirements that have been given to you. So a bit of background about myself, a bit of what we're going to be going over. As I mentioned, um, I, I design most of my presentations to be scalable because I can be given 30 minutes at a meetup group, I can be given 90 minutes to two hours at a conference like past summit. So I want to make these very modular so I can easily scale up and down the content for that. Uh, given that, I want to start from the reporting layer. That's my bread and butter. That's where I like to start in. Um, we'll talk a bit about modeling, maybe some DAX and other stuff as well, uh, time permitting. But there's a lot of topics that I can go into on this. And um, I'll pick and choose and uh, cherry pick some ones, I think, that just as the conversation goes along. Uh, I will say uh, one other quick request for you, Ken. Um, if there are any questions that come up, I'll try to pause every 10 or 15 minutes just to ask for questions. But um, if there is anything in the chat or anything else uh, um, at those times, uh, feel free to, to, for anybody who's on the chat, come off mute. Otherwise, if there's anything in the chat, let me know and I'll pop it screen up and I'll answer the questions from there. Okay. So starting from the reporting environment, uh, the, the term that I like to think of is crafting or curating the user experience. So we have a recent movie, which I think has a great title to describe how Power BI does reporting by default. Uh, when you create a report, you add a visual to the page, visual, slicers, everything else, you're given everything everywhere all at once. 
Like that is the experience with everything turned on in Power BI. It's, uh, we're going to give you the whole kitchen, uh, all the ingredients, everything. We don't really know which is appropriate for your report, but we're just going to turn everything on for you. Um, this comes in, in the, the sense of the, uh, all the header icons, all of the buttons, all the things to click, all the features available for you as you move your mouse across, you look at all the pop-ups, and that can be um, often very, uh, it can have a very high cognitive load. It's a term to describe the amount of effort it takes your brain to consume the information and the stimulus that you have in front of you. And ideally, the simplest, um, least complicated report as possible to deliver insights is what we want to aim for. Uh, we start from having everything on and have to turn things off. In a way, I wish we could start from everything off in Power BI and slowly turning on toggles one at a time, especially with the header icons. But that's the idea behind crafting the user experience is what can we configure from the perspective that we have on the slide here of setting the default user experience. This is that idea of like what things can be set as default to reduce the clicks. So, if we have a hierarchy for a, um, a particular chart, is it best serviced for people opening the report to have it at the year level? Would a quarter year make more sense? The month level? Uh, which cut of data is going to be the closest to being able to make a choice or arrive at a, an answer to a question for them with the least amount of navigation to get to the appropriate data? Um, similar with pages, sort or store location, but all of these are things that can be set for a report when you publish it and then leads to uh, a shorter journey from start to finish for individuals to arrive at some decision looking at the report. There's a lot of things as well in, in terms of the configuration. So all of these items that you see here and more can be configured for a report. And the biggest one I'd say overall is the, the visual header. So that is something that Every icon is turned on. You have everything from your pin icon to your focus mode, uh, all sorts of stuff that are enabled by default when you are building out a report. And a lot of those either A, uh, don't do anything, or B, can actually be confusing or seem like the report is breaking when people are utilizing this. And we want to avoid those just because, um, you know, to, to go to the... Um, uh, the you know the, the monkey mascot that Ken has, uh, I also like to, you know, in a way... Um, Humans are, in many senses of the word, curious uh, creatures, curious monkeys that will press a button if presented with it. So if we have a button that shows up for them in Power BI, they're going to likely want to click it. So do not give them buttons that shouldn't be pressed. So that goes a long way in describing the digital header icons that we have. And we do not want to give them any extra buttons because at a minimum, if they hover over a visual and a, and a little icon shows up to click, it's distracting at the absolute minimum. And at, at, its, at its worst, it's something that if they click, it can seem like it breaks the interface and we'll explore these in the demo, but we really want to curate those. And honestly, the fewest icons as possible, the least amount of visual header icons to click on the report will go a long way to simplifying the experience. Similar to that idea of the, the visuals and what buttons can be clicked for them in terms of interactivity, we also have the filters pane. Um, I will say that working with uh, Miguel Myers, um, I have. Uh, been very privileged and appreciative of working with the individual who recently took over the Power BI Canvas as a program manager um, this year. He comes from a background of design, and I would say the person that I look to as a goalpost in my life of like a uh, an amazing um, savant in terms of design aesthetics and theory, and also science behind UI experiences. He is a really great individual. He used to be on the, the CAT team, customer experience team at Microsoft. He switched over to managing the, the Canvas platform. He's the reason that you're getting the new curved line and uh, that new new card visual. Um, him, uh, his team, and myself and a few other MVPs that have been providing feedback have been the individuals helping to get these items pushed forward. And all these UI changes that are coming forward to Power BI um, have been happening because we finally have somebody who's really getting um, advocacy and uh, buy-in from the community to want to make the visuals better. Because that's sadly the one thing that's lacking in Power BI versus Tableau, uh, ClickView, Spotfire. Our visuals aren't as good, but the, the native ones are just not as feature rich. Same with the filters pane. There's a lot of limitations. It's still a very useful tool. I will say to sum up that little side conversation up, we have a pot at the end of the rainbow that's coming for our filters pane. Better experiences are going to come to this. But today, 
it is useful to have. I leverage it constantly, but you, there's a very specific curation process to make sure that the filters pane is as least complicated as possible. Considering that, we have report, we have page, and we have visual level filters. Each one of these has a scope or a level that allows it to uh, apply filters to the whole report, filters to the page, or filters to just the visual. If I was to make a subjective opinion, I would argue that for the most part, page level and um, report level and page level filters, these two are something that the user should configure or interact with. Outside of that, like visual level filters, like I don't almost ever build a report where I want a person to click one visual and change a filter on that particular visual on a page. That means that that one visual changes, but all the others don't. So it's, it's not a particularly intuitive experience. It's more for developer filters. When you apply a top end, um, you're removing blanks from a bar on, the column, on a bar or a column chart. So filters do get applied there when you're building the report, but they're not filters that really should be seen by the user necessarily, especially because what it, it ends up doing is it pushes all these other filters down. So you click on a visual, these get pushed down the list and it, uh, they kind of get obfuscated and hidden from that. So overall, when I build out a report, I want my visual level filters to be hidden to make sure that they're using the right scope of filtering, which would, at the end of the day, be between page and report level. So these two are the ones where I want my users to interact with, and this should be hidden by the time I publish this. So we'll observe ways to do that. But again, it's one of those things that if you publish it, it's not broken, but it's not optimized. It hasn't been curated yet. Let's take a look at some ways to actually um, edit and, and curate these as well, too, because part of the filters pane includes the filters that are built into a visual. So we have the ability to lock and hide uh, filters that have been applied in the filter pane. Generally, you lock and hide them if it's something that's been set as a developer, but it does not need to be edited by the end user. So in this case, coming up, if this has been added as a top 10. It's not locked. It's not hidden. Coming up to the top here, we can see the page title, uh, that little filter drop down is listing the top 10 page views by page title. So it's showing you the top 10 filter. Usually filters like this, either A, can be implicitly implied in the title of the visual itself or the page, or B, it's just something that's not needed. So like, let's, Models can often be very complex. The data sets can have a lot of interesting relationships with impartial mapping between keys. You often filter out blanks or other stuff where the end user does not ever need to know that there's a filter being applied. But this filter list here, I so often see people coming in where this is a super long list. There's eight or nine filters already coming into here where um, sales amount is not, is, is, does not equal zero. Uh, page title by top 10, um, ID does not equal this. There's all these developer filters that clean up the page because the model is kind of messy, but then the user has no idea what they've applied. What slicer have they selected? Did they make these selections? So another great feature, but often gets ruined by the experience if it has not been properly configured by the developer because you get all these extra filters showing up and the user does not know what they have applied versus somebody else. So this gets ignored. So this, I think at the end of the day is a very powerful feature. If I can find my arrow right here. I really like this filter icon that shows you applied filters to a visual, but I generally like to reserve this for filters uh, that can be added, removed, or modified by the user. So that's the slicer, that is the page level, and that is the report level filters in the filter pane that the user can adjust, add or remove or modify in some way. And I, that's the only thing that I want to see in this list because it keeps a consistent link between user interaction and what they can observe as things they can change. Developer filters should not show up into here. That being said, you know, if you do the items of locking and hiding as I proposed, then that filter pane is removed. Uh, the filter list is cleaned up. It's removed from there. I have implied in the title that we have the top 10 in here. If I had this at a page level to any degree, if I was filtering to last 30 days, my page would probably have some page title or title up at the top that would indicate that this is a roll-in 30-day period. So you can still title the visuals or the page to some capacity to indicate your filters, but it does not need to show up in this list. You do not need 25 visuals all indicating a page level filter. It just, um, it obfuscates the rest of the filters that they have the interaction with. So 
There are many features in Power BI that I think can be very powerful to enhance user experience, but a careful consideration and curation goes into the design of them. And that's what I mentioned about the header icon. So these can all be properly configured and designed when we are building these out. And there's a lot of them that are available by default. So we have the ability to turn off the header icons holistically at the top level. We can also turn them on at the lower level below. And every one of these can be turned on and off. I also, I try to keep this conversational. Um, like I said, I'll, with one laptop screen, I won't have the chat on, but I, I'd love to, to see if you have any things of, uh, of items you typically would like to turn on and off. I personally would say that one of my biggest ones that I do not use is the pin icon. Uh, I think dashboards to a degree are largely dead. They're, there are always arguments and it depends scenario for everything. And yes, there are some use cases for dashboards, but out of the hundreds of reports that I built to this point in the last three years, I've built maybe seven or 10 dashboards. It has not been that many uh, anymore. So like the pin icon, which is pinning the tile to the dashboard, you don't need that showing up in all the visuals if you're never going to build a dashboard. So turning those off, um, focus mode for a particular visual, Slicers, as an example, you don't need a full screen of slicer. A good argument is um, can be made on whether or not you even want a header icon at all visible on the slicer to begin with. But each one of these are things that will show up by default on the visual unless they are turned off. And I like to have as many of these off as possible. Uh, later on, I will actually talk to you about um, the, the team generator that Power BI.tips has made. So um, Mike Carlo, who loves making tools and has developed a really cool vision, uh, a really cool website here. Uh, he actually managed to scrape the GitHub repository of all of the mapped entities that can be configured in the theme file, uh, because every visual has a default that can be configured in a custom theme file, which means that using his editor, I have the ability to say in my custom theme file, which has colors on top of it, I want slices by default to have the header icons turned off. I want my bar chart to not have the pin icon. Any configurations in here, I can do per visual in there. Um, and he has his tool automatically scrape the GitHub repository, so he doesn't even need to update it. If there is a new item that gets added to the Microsoft GitHub repository of what things can be configured for themes, his tool UI automatically just updates with a new menu for that because it's scraping, I think, once a day, it's doing a daily scrape of that just to determine if any new fields are coming out of there. So it auto updates. It's a really cool tool. I'll demonstrate that at the end of this section. Um, but I have definitely built my own theme file off of there. And it is a, it's the most complete theme customizer available out there to allow you to build a perfectly bespoke theme generator with every possible configuration for title, font, formatting, colors configurations of like access titles, every possible attribute you can find for a visual that is in the format pane pretty much can be configured in there. You might spend a couple of hours on a rabbit hole deep dive figuring out what you want to configure, but once you're done, you have this nice little complete package. So it's a really useful tool. And I have yet to find any other tool that comes close to that one. So I've given him a lot of kudos on that. And he has a live stream that he did with me two months ago, I think. Uh, that he walks through it just as an FYI. So I'll have a YouTube link later on you can go check out. The one downside to all of these changes that I'm talking about, sadly, as of today, this is something that is only observable in reader mode in Power BI. Now, reader mode, to translate from the Microsoft terminology, that is the view-only experience when you're in an app or in a workspace when you're looking at a report. Power BI Desktop is an edit mode experience. That's why you can resize the visuals. Yes, you can lock them, but you still have the ability to like delete them and a few other stuff. Reader mode can only be observed in the service. So if I was to turn off the header icons for a visual, I can't actually observe those changes until I publish the report. I'll show you a couple of workarounds to expedite this process because otherwise the only way to truly confirm changes that you've made and to ensure that you've made all the right ones, make the changes in desktop, you have to publish it. Oh, you missed something. Go back to desktop, make a change, save the file, publish it. You miss something again. Imagine you have a 300 megabyte report and data set file. You're waiting two to three minutes potentially to publish that file every time you have to keep publishing it to the cloud. So we have some uh, ways to uh, reduce that latency um, around that, that cycle. 
But I will also say as a pot at the end of the rainbow, um, Muhammad Ali, who was on my stream last year, he's the program manager for Power BI Desktop. He has confirmed publicly that there is a, as part of all the major updates that are coming for Power BI in the next couple of quarters, um, this year, there will be an update that will have a reader mode button preview in the, the, the ribbon in Power BI Desktop. So you can observe what it would look like for people in the portal once you've made those changes. So this workaround won't be necessary anymore. But today, it's a little bit of a headache to kind of observe that because you can't see what icons you've truly hidden. And it's kind of easy to miss them when you turn something off, but you can't actually verify it's been turned off other than looking at the menu. Okay. Last thing in this section that I want to get into a demo and kind of talk about the things, uh, put into practice the ideas that I've been discussing. Um, help, the helper tool tip and as well is another really useful thing that can be enabled. This provides a little help question mark icon built into the header. And what this gives you is uh, up to about 250 characters, I believe. Uh, pull it into here. Yeah, 250 character limit of um, some information to explain something about the visual. It goes into that idea of curation. So. Let's assume you're using a custom visual, which is like a violin chart. Maybe there is a couple of sentences that can be used to describe how that chart works. Uh, if there's any information you need to do to explain um, anything about the visual or to help the user understand what they're looking at. Uh, unfortunately, today there's no f of x icon next to this to be able to like provide dynamic text, but you do have an option up here to assign this, I believe, to, um, uh, to a report tooltip page. So you can build a custom page uh, and utilize a shape or a button, which does have a text field that can be assigned to a measure. So you can make this dynamic where the help tooltip could be leveraging um, sales amount of some other information that maybe changes month by month, depending on what you're looking at. But the actual default text that's built into there is a static value that is included in the here. Um, but there are some other ways around it. I will say that some of the vision, going back to that idea with Miguel Myers, is um, a lot of us are advocating for the f of x button everywhere. Every single attribute that I can set in this field pane, whether or not it's bolded, italicized, underlined, the font, the font size, the color, the background, I would ideally like to see some type of dynamic formatting option applied to this, where I can basically, via model changes, have any of these changes. So that is the grand vision. How much of that actually comes out into play is to be determined, but Conditional formatting everywhere is very much a vision that most of us that have been involved in the team have very much been um, gaveling down as a uh, something that we really, really want. So hopefully more of these little attributes that you see get more of those magical F of X buttons. That pretty much means you get a conditional formatting menu that lets you pick a rule to make that change dynamically rather than having it be fixed. So fingers crossed in the next 12 to 24 months, we get a lot more of these features. Uh, with that said though, let's go ahead and hop into the demo here. One sec there. We're in these headphones all day, so the ears are a little itchy. All right, so we're going to pop over to the service right here. So as I mentioned, technically what I would be doing in here is Power BI Desktop. And I did see, uh, I guess I hated that product, just checking a chat. So um, I would normally say that in a perfect world, I would be making all of my edits as part of the user curation experience in Desktop. I actually make these changes in the Power BI portal. For the reason that having to make a change, having to publish it every single time, and then doing that over and over again to observe changes is kind of painful. So thankfully, Power BI has a way to download your files. So any changes that you make, you can uh, you can uh, download this file, and that will download it back to desktop. Um, for a long time, this was in preview. I'm pretty sure it was in preview for at least three or four years, but it's a safe way to download a copy of the PBIX. Um, there are some limitations. If you're doing this against the file data set that is incremental refresh and a few others, there's additional exceptions to be made. But generally speaking, if I can, I make the changes here. Because right now I'm in reader mode. I get all these pop-ups, but there's a lot of extra icons and stuff showing up that I do not want, that I do not need. So I do have an option to do edit up here. So let's start the conversation of what I'm looking for, those pitfalls to avoid. What are the, what's the ugly baby elements of this visual? So looking at a slicer, these are, a slicer for the most part is designed to filter other things. I don't need to know what filters are being applied to the slicer. I don't need a focus mode slicer. That looks like I broke the page. I've had users before, like I clicked a button and what happens and 
oh, there's a back to report button. But I basically blanked out my canvas. It is a button that is uh, at its worst very confusing and it seems to break the report. So I don't need these icons at all added to this slicer. So a quick and easy edit is I can come up to the edit icons. By the way, this the requirement for this is you need to have build permissions. So you have viewer, um, contributor, member, and admin that are set up in your in your workspace. I always have to think an extra second about it because contributor sounds like they should have more permissions than member, but those are the four levels. Viewers have no build permissions in a workspace. This edit icon is only available for people with member, contributor, admin access to our workspace, just as an FYI. But you have an ability to click edit. You basically get an, a report canvas edit experience, nearly identical to Power BI Desktop. Um, outside of, I think you can import some custom PM files and a few other minor items. But I can come up, just like in, in, uh, in Power BI Desktop, and I can make edits. So I can come over to select the slicer, and come over to format your visual, I'm going to go to general and I'm going to turn off the header icons in its entirety. So that gets disabled. Also notice, by the way, the tooltip changes to the visual header visibility will only be applied in reader view, reader mode, reader view, however you want to turn, uh, determine it. I still see them. I've turned it off. I cannot observe my changes yet. But if I come back to reading view, save, Now, icons aren't popping up. So I want to minimize pop-up because pop-ups distract. So whether or not you turn off the header icon entirely, whether or not you turn them off per visual, those are things to keep in mind. And there's a big degree of a lot of people, I think, build out the report in desktop. They go through with a fine-tooth comb. They check every box. They look at everything in desktop, but they don't see how the report looks once it's been published. And today, there is no there is no alternative to truly reviewing it. You have to publish this, and like quite literally, take your your mouse cursor and make sure things are being applied. There are ways to ensure that some of these things won't happen using some of those theme generators that I talked about. But you, without using one of those, you still might miss things. So you want to really like actually comb through report what pop up am I getting? So my slicer has no uh, no longer has a pop up. Notice by the way. The, um, the visual that I'm using behind this in here. This has an icon pop-up in the back. So this, uh, this shape item that I added onto the page is also including those. So that's something that we can edit as well. Um, I usually get a couple people making a comment here where why use a shape when you can also design the background yourself. Um, I will say that I'm actually a huge fan of the, I come up to here, I, I love the snap to grid in Power BI, Snap to Grid moves and resizes visuals eight pixels at a time. If I just add a shape into the background, I automatically can create a frame that is perfectly eight pixels in a line with the, uh, the items. If I wanted to move the group together, it moves on its own. And uh, I just find it extra hassle to go into PowerPoint and make a, um, a background image that, yes, I can get the approximate same locations of that, but it's I find it's less agile, and if I need to resize by like one pixel, oh, I need to move this over by one snap. Very quickly can can realign stuff. So I just personally prefer to use background shapes. It has a tiny bit of performance cost. That one shape on this report page probably added 10, 12 milliseconds to the page load time. But if you have one or two shapes loaded on your report page, in the, the day, that's not that much of performance impact. Uh, but I only bring that up because um, Mike Carlo prefers like background images. I think it's a it's an either or. It depends on the situation um, and personal preference. But this is something that if you already use a background image, two things need to be turned on um, in the the items. One of these is now on by default. So the header icons on, on the new shape visuals when you bring these in now, they're off by default. This did not used to be the case, but now if you actually add a new shape, which Let's try this. If I go to here and I add a rectangle somewhere, I believe, or at least in new reports, the header icons will be turned off. But you want those header icons off because then you won't get those pop-ups. And number two, the other really important thing that you need to ensure is the maintain layer order is turned on. What that, what that means is that whatever order it is in, in your selection pane, will be maintained. This is below these other items, so it will stay there. 
Again, you cannot observe this in desktop, but I'll show you the breaking the breaking problem. If I forgot to do that, I'm gonna, come do and, I'm gonna do save, open this again. If somebody clicks it, this is what happens. It pops up and it looks like it breaks. So you need to make sure your header icons are turned off and that the maintain layer order is, is uh, also enabled. Now, one other little just pro tip about this, the only thing where this matters is this one. It prevents background objects from moving forward. If the other objects are already in front of it, it doesn't matter. So these three objects here, which is this, this, and this, they're already the frontmost layer. So yes, if you wanted to, you could turn it on here, but it technically does not matter because there is nothing for them to accidentally show in front of. So I have it turned off for this one and for this one and so on. So those other ones do not actually need the layer order turned on. It's only the background object that needs to be prevented from coming forward where you need to have that disabled. So that's why you have those um, turned off. And between those two, coming back to reading view, now we have no hover, we have no click. I, I want the least amount of pop-ups and distractions on a report page. So nothing that can be clicked that shouldn't be or seems to be clickable, slicers as well. But the other thing that we want to consider is what icons can be turned off for a particular visual. So like for this item down here, that pin icon, is that something that we need? Do we need a focus mode for some of these as well? So some arguments can be made on whether or not that's useful. The focus mode is useful-ish for a, a particular visual, but the sad part is also it doesn't scale. Uh, again, these are things on the roadmap that have been discussed with Miguel Myers. Um, one of our recommendations is the fact that when we focus a visual, the, uh, the font size should scale up and be appropriate given the visual size. But you, there's at least some value that might be derived out of that. But at the end of the day, is it something you want or not? So, in this case, what icons might we want to turn off for a particular visualization? So coming over to the header icons down here, we go to the icon section down below. There's all these icons that are being turned on. So like is the pin icon something that is important for us? Do we want the focus mode? What items do we want to see? Like see data layout, that's that option to be able to come and uh, show his table. Do we want to actually be able to see that um, you know, as the, as the underlying data for analysts? Maybe for the business user, maybe not. So I would argue that so that's something that we could actually turn off in entirety. So if we actually turn this off, let's just take a look at some of these that we've disabled. So I'm going to click Save. Turn this off here. And now we have, we have a copy image, but the pin icon's been turned off. The um, Some of the other icons have been disabled. So every one of these that we don't need can be disabled for a visual to reduce the number of icons to click. We can see that I have a helper icon at least, which gives me information to display what a ribbon chart does. So I've given him some context of explaining how a ribbon chart works and what its goal is in terms of ranking and comparisons across categories. But that is on the visual itself and we can curate the header icon list between some of those. But the, the fact that like chart contains a non-number uh, null value, that might be a modeling issue that may or may not be able to be solved. It's a, a thing we want the user to see. I'd say that the average business user probably wouldn't understand what that means. I believe if we come over to the header icon, visual information, warning error, comes off. There we go. No more warning icons. The data hasn't changed, still there, but any modeling complexities that the user doesn't necessarily need to know about have been solved. So we have now talked about how to curate the header icons for objects, slices entirely, we can turn off individual icons, but also now let's come to the idea of filter icons in the filter list here. So this again is that list of items that I think the user should be, um, or better said, the only things the user should see in here are user configurable filters. So highlighting that, that would be data as of, because there is a, there's a filter in the filter pane that lets us choose, does the data end through the prior complete month or does it end through the current month? That is selectable. So a little checkbox, we wanna keep that. So the metric page view, that is something that is up here. So that is also, yes, we wanna keep that. So this is a developer filter. Metric is not um, page, Session down here, that is something that we do not need. So I would argue that uh, we wanna go ahead and get rid of that. And then source, 
top five that is indicated here. One, we need to change that. There's another pitfall. We now have to make sure that the title is, uh, or the title is named appropriately. This is something that should be removed. So the only two that I should see in this list are those first two in there. So let's come back to the edit icon here. The one thing that we can do um, with this is we want to ensure that everything that is in here has been hidden. So we open the filters pane. We get rid of my selection and close these down. And let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. So we have a couple items in here. So you can see that metric is not average session. I'm not even going to get into the modeling. I just know that based on the model and the data set, this page needs that filter. The user does not need to know this exists as a filter, though. So it's been locked, but it's not been hidden. Now, personally, I've not found many scenarios where I want to lock this, but also not hide it. If I'm going to lock it, generally I'm going to have a page name or there's going to be a card or a title somewhere on the page to indicate that filter being applied, or it just doesn't even need to be known. But locking and hiding usually go hand in hand. They're two halves of the same coin. So we're going to go ahead and hide that. As I mentioned, data as of prior month, that is a selectable configuration between these two that the end user is going to select. So we want that on the page. That is something that the user can change. So that has been hidden, at least from here. We come back to this. And also we want to make sure one more, uh, one thing that I forgot. So the, um, the top end filter in here. So that one needs to be updated in the title because this is the top five, not a top 10. Um, I will say as a pitfall to bring it to some other conversations, just make sure that if you ever apply a filter or anything else, you keep your title up to date. It is very easy to forget those. So that should be changed to top five. And then this as well should be hidden. Coming back to reading view, saving my changes. Now we have a curated filter list that is only going to show user configurable filters. The selection at the top, by the way, is just letting me change between values in this item. So that's why. That um, will change, and then if I do prior versus current month, same thing, data down here changes. So user configurable, that is what I want to keep into this list. And the last thing that I'm going to mention as far as part as uh, the user curation experience, before I start to move into a little bit of modeling, is I want us to understand the idea behind um, the filter pane as well. Again, we have three, three scopes. We have report level over here. At page level, and we have visual level. And those three scopes are collectively what we can apply to the visuals, the page, or the report. The only two that I would expect for us to use as a report user would be these two. So the issue, if we don't curate the filter pane, is we click on the visual. Where did all my filters go for my page and my report? They got shoved down the list because all of these filters for this visual are taking up all the real estate space. So I don't want to have a user click and then have to scroll. So in a perfect world, we would have those hidden. We can come up to the edit icon here and selecting the visual, and this is unfortunately not a fast process as of today. It is something you have to hide one at a time. <clears throat> there are some ways to kind of hack the data set file using Power BI tools that Matthias Tierbach has built. Um, he's actually one of the reasons we got Tyndall, <laughs> the new uh, readable language for data sets, to be a little advanced for a minute. Um, but there is no official way to um, easily edit the report layer to hide these automatically without um, going against official practices to do this. The way to officially do this is you have to click the visual and you have to hide these one at a time. I wish there was a faster way to do that. I have um, looked into a few options and maybe having an external tool that can do this. I'm hoping also we get a readable report layout file layer someday. So a instead of Timdle, like a RMDL, a RIMDL language that can allow us to do report reading. But until we have that, this is really the only way to do so. So I've, I've hidden them. Yes, it's a manual process. It takes time, but when you get a curated experience. So I have filters in this page. Oh, I missed a couple. So one more time, let's go back to edit. And again, this is why editing the Power BI service is really useful. Hide, hide, hide. Back to the reading view. There we go. Okay. I have the two scoped filters that I care about as the end user. I click a visual, nothing shows up. I can click it a thousand times. 
my filter pane doesn't change. So this goes a long way in ensuring that that filter pane is as simple and as straightforward as possible for the end users to utilize as you're going into this. So yes, there is work that is involved in doing this. You have to think about the headers. You have to think about what is uh, needed. You have to navigate the user experience and quite literally comb through it. But the extra effort that goes into this goes a long way. Um, and a lot of, uh, like these are the things that I show clients as well too. When people ask like, you know, why does a typical report take 40 to 60 hours to build? Isn't it just connecting a data source and throwing a couple of visuals on a page and handing in the file? Yes, like to a degree, you could do that, but it's not gonna be good, it's not gonna be curated. You're not gonna get user feedback on what works. To get a really good high quality report that's been curated and designed to be as simple and straightforward as possible takes time. Um, just because there's a lot of consideration. You get the everything ever, everywhere all at once scenario. Even things you can see over here on, on the, uh, the right, especially when you've had a file that's been maintained over five years. The problem, unfortunately, is if you put a column into any of these wells, um, and a well, by the way, is the Microsoft terminology for this section here. Anytime you see these, in Microsoft documentation, these are referred to as wells. So if you've ever added a column in your filter pane, and at some point that column gets renamed or deleted, better said, if it gets deleted from your model, it doesn't actually delete from your, from your list. You'll get a warning icon saying the field is no longer valid, so it's invalid. Those are other cobwebs that I see in a report when I see people building these out and especially maintaining them is these kind of gunk up the list after a while. So just also make sure that you are removing that from the list. Let's see if I can find another one. Here we go. So last also little uh, takeaway from this is part of a curation. This is something that I, I wouldn't necessarily, the end user is never gonna know this, but at the visual level, when you add a field from your data section in here into any one of these, it automatically shows up somewhere in this list. Depending on how you've configured the visual, when you delete a field from this list, it doesn't necessarily get rid of it here. Right now, notice the fact that I do not have an option to delete this field here. I'm gonna zoom in again on this one. I need a hover, there we go. This is letting me delete it. If you ever notice a time, um, an, I, an opportunity where you see an X icon, on a filter on this visual, that means that it is no longer in any of the wells over here. And that also means that this has no filter on it. If it is not in a well and it is not ha does not have a filter on it, there is a high likelihood that you can delete it. At some point, that visual contained this column or measure, but it has since been removed. It's not being filtered on. So it, the, the, these are the um, icing on the cake for a bit of model cleanup, but if you're really trying to polish every cobweb away from your report, get rid of every unused item that isn't needed anymore, especially if you're handing this off and you want this to be as simple as possible, these are those times where you can actually delete those. So I would recommend to go ahead and get rid of any of those items where you can see that, because again, this visual does not have it, does not need it, and it's no longer being used. All of these are still somewhere in the well. A lot of these are in my tool tips. But those top two items were not in, were neither filtered or used in the visual anymore. The user will never know that, but at least you've gotten rid of a few columns. So now you have transparency on every, every filter on this visual that's in the well for that particular visualization. It's either tied to a filter being applied or it's tied to a field that is being used somewhere in this filter list down here. So it, uh, it shores things up just a little bit more. And again, this is the, these are the, the drops in the pond versus bigger pushes and changes for your end user. But you as a developer, for someone who just wants to do a bit of house cleanup, that does help out a, a bit because that can kind of start to collect junk after a while. Again, especially when you've maintained, evolved, and iterated over this report for months, if not years. All right. So before I move into the modeling section, um, I, I just want to give myself a break to, for a minute to take a drink of water, but also ask if there's any questions, um, just because again, I love to be able to actually converse with people, not just present. I have tons of cool stuff to talk about, um, but let me check the chat here. Um, yeah, I can to, to your thing. Um, that's actually a, a feature that I've requested um, for um, the Power BI ideas section. 
Now with the header icons, we can at least turn them all off there, but also the visual level filters, having a, a button to turn those all off. I have been told by the product team that one of the next evolutions of um, Power BI Desktop, when they're doing the big push, when we get Power Query online in the Power BI Desktop and we get the major upgrade, that's probably coming in the next six months or so, apparently the ability to hide all visual level filters at once per visual at the top level with a button like up here will be coming where there'll be a master hide all button that will be somewhere like up here. So at a minimum, I'm really looking forward to that. But I think that most of this will be solved by people and experts and external tools. If we can get the Tyndall layer for a Tyndall language for the report layer, there's going to be a floodgate of external tools and reporting a uh, report best practices analyzer and buttons where you can click something and it just auto applies everything. Also, that will all be um, officially supported for the report layer. So I, my my biggest thing that I'm putting all my um, eggs in one basket on is I'm just waiting for hopefully some type of a, a reporting language, readable reporting language to come out because I'm sure so many people, including myself, will probably want to write some type of an external tool that will have uh, check boxes that will scan, tell you where you have problems in your report and automatically apply fixes for you. Because right now the, um, the escape return JSON is nearly impossible uh, to navigate and um, I've tried and I would love to, to, to see some buttons that will be the easy red button you can click to make a lot of these fixes because it's kind of painfully slow right now. So hey Reed, uh, just a, just a quick comment on that. Like, and and you yeah. know me. I mean, I I write my own software for uh, for working mm -hmm. with uh, with Excel and whatever else as well. So I mean, I think that the languages and everything else to be able to do this, that's awesome. It's really cool. It gives us some incredible ability. But I don't think that that actually shirks the responsibility from the Power BI team to make some of these things so that they are native to the product. Like, you shouldn't I, I need a third party tool to save you. I mean, you know. 10 hours to build your report, 40 hours of unchecking individual buttons. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And you shouldn't need to, a third party tool to do that, right? So, um, yeah. I hope you, know, you get knowing, the language. Knowing Microsoft's history, <laughs> I think the, the thing that we're going to get first is probably just, hey, we're not going to actually build the UI for this, but we're going to unlock the ability for you to build a tool with the UI to do that. And it's probably yeah, going to be. Don't disagree. <laughs> yeah, that, that will be the Gen 1, which is still better than nothing. I, I, I agree that why, for the love of, whatever, is there not a button to say hide all up here? That should be built in, or there should be just an option at the report setting where just by default, hide visual level filters. I want a master report level section. I've even talked with Mike about this. Is there any way for your uh, your, uh, your theme tool to do that? And like, that's not a, it's not an, um, there's no configuration that is unlocked as part of the, the Git repository that lets you do that. But I just want something in here at the report settings, hide visual level filters by default uncheck them if I don't want to, just flip the switch. It's kind of the the difference between, um, it's one of the few times that I actually have a feature in here that I like, but so uh, there there's the um, use, use filtering rather than cross highlighting. Here we go, right here. One of the few times that I actually have seen a feature that I want at the report level that I'm happy, but change the vi default visual interaction from cross highlighting to cross filtering. Before that existed, I had to go to every single visual and change it. And that was a thousand clicks. It, it is a, it's my least favorite thing to do, and I have to put on my favorite playlist because otherwise it is the most boring job in the world. But we as developers have to do that. So yes, Microsoft is thankfully starting to up its game on this, but it is a unnecessarily painfully slow process. And um, Rob, my, my, my last boss before I went independent, Rob Colley, um, I think his terms for like, you know, using Power Query as, you, as your savior, but like um, data wrangling manually in Excel is, is death by a thousand cuts. You know, it's the, it's the slow, painful thing that nobody likes to do, but you have to do it. And there are a few of those for sure in the reporting layer in Power BI. Um, but at least I'm starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel now that Miguel is take, um, helping to push initiatives forward to make the developer experience a bit easier. I would uh, anyway. say the other the other thing that it would be super mm -hmm. important with that read is the uh, when you are when you do start making those changes inside Power BI Desktop, you need to be able to see it. I mean, to have to publish it to the service and hit save, and even with your hack that you're using there, uh, is crazy. Like that that needs to react so you can see that you've made a change right live. But uh, hopefully they'll get there one day. Anyway, I see you got another question there as well from uh, from Andrew. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually like just like I don't I said you probably know teams. There. Is there a way to pop out the chat out of curiosity? Because I'm realizing I can't actually clap for my chat pane. Like, I actually don't want all these other conversations. But how would you just pop out the uh, – there you go. I'll, uh, I'll see the contact. Yeah. But can you, can you pop out a chat window? 
I'm on the new team, so I think you can on here, but um, okay. yeah, well, I've, I've actually got a pop out button, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, hover over the chat. Let's, find, let's just quickly see that. Hover over the chat and click the ellipses. Mark, dun, dun, dun. maybe not, maybe not on the new ones. Yeah, so either way, I'll uh, I solve this for now. I'll look at it later. Okay, so we have the, the question maybe far off track. Do you have a book, a book recommendation to get? So, I will say just as a general thing, the, there, are, there are many good books out there. Uh, Ken has a great one on um, writing Power Query. There are some good ones on reporting and other stuff. The, uh, I've, I've, seen it, I've seen an escalation of speed in terms of how quickly these products evolve. And it, um, I'm sure a lot of authors out there can probably attest to the fact that it's harder and harder to actually write a book that is relevant long enough versus web courses. So like um, SkillWave has a bunch of courses. And the nice thing about that is if you have one video that needs to be updated, it's really easy to replace that one video and, and make, a, make an updated module for that. It's a lot harder to update three pages in a book as, as it needs to. So I usually start to steer people more towards um, online courses for this stuff because those can at least be iterated through. Um, SkillWave is a bunch um, slightly biased, obviously, because I host one up there. Um, but some of the, the better content that's uh, been written by uh, Ken and Miguel on Power Query. Matt Allington does a really good job on DAX. Uh, I like to kind of equate him to like Star Wars, Star Trek episodes. They explain a really complex scientific theory, but then they boil it down to like, oh, it's it's like overinflating the balloon. I understood that. Matt does a really good job, I think, of uh, explaining DAX that way. He he he's geared towards business users with a lot of his stuff, so he takes this complex and makes it simple. Um, I have the, a reporting course that's on there. Outside of them, um, let's see, good data analyst to help thinking about things like this. So I'm actually going to give you a, a blog of probably my favorite person in the world. So there's there's only a few people that exist that I that I would say I could, I cannot touch their skill. So a lot of blogs or articles or books is like if give me a thousand hours I I could produce that quality. Kurt Bueller, um, data goblins. Uh, on top of the fact that he has a PhD in chemistry and he switched into analytics because he thought it was fun. Um, and he writes articles that just blow me away. And he's also a D&D nerd. Uh, at some point, I'm hoping we actually can uh, do a session together because we've talked about actually doing a live stream of mine. He would DM and we would actually have a Dungeons and Dragons campaign together. But he, he writes the most articulate well thought out, well curated articles of, of anybody that I know in Power BI. It's really, really skilled, and he does soft skill stuff. He has a whole article that talks about how being um, leading a campaign in Dungeons and Dragons, being a DM, how that helps him be a better manager. And it is a really good article. Uh, it was one of his most recent ones that he wrote. Uh, where is it? Um, like analyzing video game data for personal projects, solving the right problems, formatting Power Query. Uh, there we go. Playing Dungeons and Dragons was the best thing I did for my Power BI career. And it just it's a soft skills conversation that goes into all this stuff about being a data professional and how having to run a group of friends who bounce around conversations and everything. You have to wrangle them in. You have to keep, you know, ideas focused. Like he, he's a really, really great individual. And apparently these things are very cathartic for him. Uh, I read one of these articles like, oh, yeah, Kurt, this took you, what, two, three weeks to write? Oh, no, I did this in like 72 hours. Like, did you sleep? Not really, but I basically was just locked in my office for a couple of days, and I wrote out these 20 pages that, uh, you know, like, I really like to do this. So he, uh, he's, he's, yeah, by and far my, my favorite uh, writer. Uh, he hasn't gotten his, I don't think he's gotten his MVP yet, and he should. So hopefully by this time next year, he will finally have his MVP because he deserves it, I think, just as much as anybody else that's in the community. Really cool stuff. And uh, he has lists, you know, um, multiple lists on checklists on how to do stuff. So Power BI checklist. What do you need to do uh, to create a, a data gateway? Um, one of my favorite ones down here, if I can find it, uh, like reports, the reporting checklist of all the things that you need to build a report. And you can quite literally check the items that you need. He has tool tips that pop up to explain what to do for some of these and like videos on it. So like, and it's, oh, so, uh, the ad was playing in my ear. So, uh, yeah, please subscribe to him. Uh, you know, check out his stuff. He does just absolutely gangbuster amazing, amazing things. Um, but like I said, one of the few people that I know that just give me enough time, I still probably could not produce content quite as good as he does. He is a really cool individual. 
Um, so uh, that's probably my takeaway, especially because he focuses on design quite a bit. Um, he has a lot of really cool ideas. And there's one other just article that I'll mention in here if I can bring this up where it's in here. There is a, a recent article and it's about report layer objects. And it was, I've had these thoughts in smaller videos and he manages to bring this up specifically. Here we go, reporting layer objects. One of my favorite ones because there's oftentimes where you write a measure that's for a title of a particular visual. You write a calculation that's designed as a specific filter for a particular visual to get certain rows to show up. Reporting layer objects. And he breaks this down into every type of object you could possibly add that is a report layer object that may or may not should be uh, not be added to your golden data set. And it goes through a whole thing. He actually records podcasts that you can listen to. But again, he uh, breaks it down. He has little interactive uh, objects in here, visuals that show everything, and checklists that go into this. So this was one of those where we, <laughs> he has to fix the Power BI embedded. Um, it's just, I, I, I get a, a little envious. I'm like, man, I, I've had these thoughts before. I've never collected them together. And this is exactly the kind of thing that I wish I could have uh, written myself. But one last little report layer um, article that uh, just b blew me away when I read it. I have to make sure to sit down and actually spend probably 30, 20 to 30 minutes to read his articles every time they, uh, I see a release from his blog. Um, but he has, he has fun. You know, he has an artist that does, that does his data gobbles. And he's actually the artist that I use for my avatar now. All of my um, all of my newer ones, because my previous one exited the platform that I used to go to. So now, if you ever see new avatars of my character on YouTube, you might notice a similar drawing style to this, is because I actually asked Kurt where he is, his artist is, and all of my new character avatars will now be based off of uh, for being illustrated by the same artist, because I really liked the graphical style. It's a great question. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, give me a chance to actually stand up a friend, because uh, he's, he's a really great individual. Um, before I maybe do a couple more demos, um, I'll try to keep this, uh, should be finishing up around 6.30, but I have a few other things that I can talk about in the model. But I also just love conversations, honestly. Um, is, is, there, is there anything else that anybody would want to come off mute and uh, ask a question on or anything they want to drop into the chat? So I'll give that a couple seconds. I have a drink of water, and if not, I'll um, talk about a few other things in the model um, in Power BI Desktop as well. Okay, so we're going to come. Over to here. I like that, uh, just as a little left where I like things that, that excite me every once in a while is I enjoy that there is a, a more apparent icon down here to switch to mobile view now. They, they made it a bit more um, readily accessible in the latest build of Power Bay Desktop, which is nice. But what I want to do is discuss some other things and some pitfalls that we want to avoid. So one of the biggest ones as a thing that I clean up first and foremost, and this, this honestly is inherited all the way back from my days in Excel. So when somebody tells me they're like an expert report builder in Excel or in Power BI, I look for named objects. So if I open up your selection pane or in Excel, if, if I'm looking at your table name, if you have like 15 tab sheets and every one of your tables is table one through table 65, it's not a red flag, but it's a little yellow flag. Like there's a, there's a teeny bit of extra polish that has not gone into cleaning up and organizing. In a way, it's like it's taking notes, you know, it's naming the objects correctly. So what I'm, this is what I'm referring to, to agree. Like I don't want to see a list that looks like this in Power BI. In your selection pane, I would hope you would have named, organized, and grouped stuff. I don't want to see a thing called text box. I want to know what that text box is for. Is that a background object? This is how I would ex I would hope and expect your list to look. So much more curated. You have hierarchies and, and menus of grouped objects to navigate down. I have my title section organized together. Separate conversation on number of unique objects and performance, but I have a title section that can be organized and grouped, and everything has been named grouped and subgrouped accordingly down the list in those. So it has cleaned up that list to a nice, clean, organized section. Same press practices in a PowerPoint um, deck. Grouping goes a long way to helping to indicate what you're looking for. And especially if you need to copy move, if you're ever using bookmarks, my God, like using groups 
significantly better on, uh, especially from hiding and, and, uh, and throwing objects, filtering and all that. So groups go a long way. But that's one of those first things that I look at. What kind of house cleanup has a person done when they are organizing the selection pane? And proper naming like that is actually a really good way to do that. Actually, okay, now that I'm here, yes, please hey, go ahead. Uh, this is Mark from Minnesota. Say, hello, Mark. Earlier, you said um, you didn't like dashboards. Would this not qualify as a dashboard? No, uh, great question. So, a dashboard is a specific thing in the Power BI um, service, and again, like it's, it's something that not not a lot of people use anymore. So, if you pin this icon in here. You pin it to a something called an actual dashboard. So in a workspace, a dashboard will actually be, if I go to this here, and I hate the new navigation. You know, I, I miss the little sections that used to show everything, but a dashboard is a specific thing that can be built in Power BI, uh, only in the Power BI service. You pin tiles. It kind of looks like Windows 8 Metro. So it's gonna go test, let's just call this a test dashboard and pin that there. And then it should now show up. There you go. So there's a dashboard. Dashboard has a little symbol. This is what a dashboard would be. It is, it is actually a collection of visuals and tiles, multiple reports in one workspace. It was something that came out Power BI initially. It was designed to be kind of almost a high-level executive view. You have quadrants you can attach these to, and you can, it was the first thing that QA and a few others. But for the most part, it hasn't really evolved much in the last, four to five years. And a, a good report does all of this. So this is what I refer to as a dashboard. It is something that exists in a workspace, but it is almost never built. Um, I'm sure some people out there have built one. Ken, maybe you've built a few for, I'm sure you built some uh, for clients over the years, but it it's a definitely an exception to the rule. And most of the time when I build a report, I do not have dashboards that are built on top of them as an extra layer. But that's what I refer to as a dashboard. And of course, infusion probably from this question, potentially comes up from the fact that for Power BI existed, reports and dashboards were synonyms. You mean that they mean the same thing. A dashboard is a cooler term to describe what you've built for a client, but of course it is a reserved name now in Microsoft. So I try to avoid using that term unless I'm referring to the actual artifact of the dashboard in the service because technically they're separate from reports. Perfect. Thanks for explaining yeah, no that. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Like I like I said is I honestly used to even cover them, cover them in my training. I don't even talk about them anymore. I, I mentioned that they exist, but I, I don't even go through a tutorial of how to build them just because one, they're not that hard to build. It takes a couple of minutes usually to, to make one and two, they're just really used uh, by clients. But thank you for bringing that up because yes, that is actually a good situation where they are um, can be confused with each other. Uh, define names are probably good documentation. Uh, great point, Charles. But that is one thing that I want to discuss in here. And on the idea of documentation, I think three things that I'm going to bring up as a final uh, finalization of this that will allow us to finish this off. And I want to leave it up for some questions and I'll have some links and other stuff for you. But I would say for myself, I, I don't like taking notes. I do because I have to. And it is good practice, especially as a consultant, to hand notes off to clients. I have tools that document it for me. So... Uh, and Ken, if you can drop a link in it for it, but um, Mark's, um, where is it? It's Mark's Power, Mark's Power BI document uh, model tool. Um, uh, Mark Lillaveld, if I can pronounce his last name correctly, but he has an external tool, which is it basically builds a P of AX that documents stuff. Fantastic auto, auto documentation tool. But anything that can kind of do it for me or when I can document one breadcrumb at a time, that's what I like to do. I just do not enjoy sitting down for two hours and line item after line item and having a document. So when there's tools such as the document uh, model thing that Mark built or um, ways to sprinkle notes in, that's what I like to do. So given the external tool thing that I mentioned, the ways that I sprinkle notes in the Power BI, I'll, do, I'll mention two ways to do this with DAC, two ways to do this with Power Query, to organize and document. So to one degree, if you don't do this already, anytime you're in a DAX measure, and this is less about a com conversation on the measure itself and what's in the measure, the thing that I just want to show you is if you do two forward slashes, you can type in any notes. Uh, notes go here. So very regularly with my clients, 
every time I have a measure that does anything that's a little bit complicated, I will add notes throughout the measure to indicate like uh, above measure is doing X. I will sprinkle notes across the, the, the calculation. And as, as I'm writing out the measure, I will add little itty bitty notes here and there just to explain what I'm doing. So built into the measure, notes go a long way to helping that out. And two, the other place you can do it on is to help explain what the measure is doing is your description. So median session duration uh, notes. And I'll throw like a little, little happy uh, emoji in there just to make it a bit fun. So now I'm going to come back to my report layer because I've added a description to this measure. And the best part about if you have a connected data set, if you've done a shared data set and somebody is going to get data and connecting to your Power BI data set in here, um, where is it? Power BI data set like that. So they won't ever see your measure, but they will see your description. So if you actually want to help indicate what that measure is doing when they can't actually see your underlying model, descriptions are very useful. Um, I actually have a video in my uh, that I did a couple of years ago where I used Tabular Editor. I run a C sharp script for what it does is it basically copies and pastes your formula from here and it pastes it into your description for every measure. So technically, you actually get the formula that is a tooltip description across all of your measures. So you get transparency on what the code is. So I have um, a video um, on my YouTube channel that walks you through how to do that, which is quite useful. But that's two ways to kind of um, use DAX and notes. The other one that I'll wrap up my conversation here on is Power Query. Um, Ken's favorite thing. So one that I, one thing that I love to do, uh, and Ken, I'm sure you vehemently, uh, hopefully vehemently agree with me on this, please, for the love of God, when we get a new Power BI for Power Query, have a search box that says, let me search for my queries at the top. I have definitely had enterprise models with like 120 queries, which is not bad. Sometimes you have a lot of staging queries and stuff like that. But God, even with folders, it's so hard to find a query sometimes. Everything else in the model, our, da our data tab has a search field in here. Why can't we have that for query names in Power Query? I would love to have that someday. But because we don't, the best thing to do, arguably, is to make sure that in your queries that you have are foldered, subfoldered, and organized. So I generally like to do things um, along the lines of loaded data model. I like to do ETL as my top group. So everything that's loaded in here, ignoring the fact that I have to you know, probably configure my IP right now for some of these. So this is loaded data model. That's my, uh, that's my L, that's my load. And then anything that would be staging, so let's just assume that these ones, one, two, three, group to group, staging queries. And then I'll do that. And I'm just gonna say that this is my, let's just call this my data source, just for the sake of this demonstration. So any data sources that I might have would be at the bottom. So in general, I like to have my e, um, e you know, my extract transform load. So at the top level, those are the three primary groups that I need. And you can have subgroups and subgroups and subgroups. So you can folder these as much as you need to, but it organizes this way. Now, I also explicitly like to organize it top to bottom like this. Here's the reason why. Another bug, not a feature for me, flows out of this. So I collapsed those. I would like to see for, um, that's fine, for some of these in the data tab, if I close my workbook, you know what happens when I open this up? These are not expanded. I don't, ex I don't open this up and see this. I don't see everything expanded out. What is happening when I open my data tab, everything is closed. I close all of my folders in Power Query. When I come back and look at this, it's expanded every time. There is no way to, to there, it does not stay your selection on expand and collapse. So because of that, generally speaking, I like to show my queries that I'm loading at the top. Those are my most important queries. The data that is being loaded to my model is typically what I want to look at first. So my L, my load, is going to be anchored at the top. And then my um, the E and T, which would be my data sources, parameters, queries, anything that cont kind of contains my source data, usually the connections to the databases, that's going to be in my data source folder. And then my staging queries or any type of um, temp table kind of stuff is going to be kept in my staging query section there. But it's because of that expand issue that I actually anchor my load at the very top because this will always open expanded. If you have 
60 queries, you don't want to have to scroll down to find them every time. So that goes a long way to organizing them. Another pro tip that I'll uh, wrap up my conversations with. So adding notes. There's two places that you can add notes built into the queries. So let's assume that I added some I'm going to rename this complex, confusing step. This is a complex, confusing step. My client is not going to know what this step is doing or why I did it. If I need to add a note to explain this, I don't want to have to go to a PDF document or a, a Word document or a OneNote document and document this. I'm just going to put this right into the step. I'm going to right click on here. I'm going to go to properties, explanation on why I did this step. We get an icon that shows up indicating that there's information and check it out. When I hover over it, there's my note. I can, I can add, based off the title and the description, all the notes generally that I would need to document on why this query was done, why this step was done, is built into that right there. So I honestly, for the most part, I don't document my Power Query stuff. Outside of, I have files sometimes where I export the query code that is also archived in GitHub and other stuff. But in terms of notes on why and explaining, it is all built into Power Query. I, I honestly do not find a need to maintain a separate document because then you have to look at the document, look at the step name, what page is it on, come back to the, the thing here. Having it built into Power Query makes it a lot easier to understand. So having little explainer notes in here really is useful to providing context for that. And you can do that at an applied step Technically, that actually does add it in the advanced editor. So notice that it codes it in here. If I actually wanted to um, come in and add a, a note below this, nope, it does the same thing, but this the, the properties menu prevents you from needing to actually edit the code inside of the um, uh, advanced editor. So if you, if you don't want to touch the scary advanced editor, which is code editing technically, you can just use the properties menu which adds it right there. So it's a codeless way to add notes. And finally, properties for the query itself. And to do the properties button, properties, query note. Let's add another little fun symbol. Let's add a, I'm gonna put my whiz. Oh, interesting. So the heart shows up, but apparently my wizard emoji shows up as a male symbol and something else. But I was trying to I was trying to add a wizard into there, but I, I guess it didn't recognize that. But now you do not sadly get a an icon to indicate that there's a note into there, but you at least get the tooltip that pops up when you hover over it that explains the note. So you can add notes at the query level to explain why you did this query. Like this distinct list of customer IDs is, is designed to be an inner join against this table, whatever that might be. But here's a way that you've seen with DAX, two, two locations in Power Query, you've seen how to organize and how to also add notes without any code built right into the queries or built right into the steps. Because again, I personally hate taking notes, but when I can do it as easily as this, it's really easy to develop and take notes at the same time. I don't have to do them separately. I just organically take notes as they go along inside of the measure, in the description, or inside of the applied steps in the properties menu as I add these in. Um, with that said, um, I want to kind of open it up for any questions or anything else hey, and also provide you a few links as well. Reed, I'm going to give you a quick comment just on the documentation on Power Query just because this mm -hmm. is sort of my area. A couple, a couple of, course, of quick please. notes. Um, number one, uh, under your merge queries and append queries buttons on the top of the tab um, right now, uh, yep. you'll notice there's a merge queries as new or a merge queries mm -hmm. um, yeah. step on this one. One of the things that I highly recommend is that you never use merge queries as new. Um, or append queries is new. And the reason being is because you can have multiple tables that are being merged or, or whatever else, and they all get folded up into a source step that has no ability to show that note or anything like that. I always prefer to do a reference to a place and then add it as a separate step afterwards. It makes it a little bit more self-documenting. The other thing that I would caution mm -hmm. people on is I am very, very careful with renaming steps in the applied win steps area. I have no problem with adding description notes, but as far as uh, I've seen people who go hog wild renaming steps, it takes me much longer to read your code if you've renamed your steps custom than if you left them to default, because I know how to read what those steps actually do. The notes are super useful, but when you start renaming every step along the way, that actually can cause more problems that can help. So just use your powers for good and, and react accordingly on that. It is a balance. Um, but don't go totally nuts on on renaming without thinking that thing through, in my opinion. 
Yeah, and like, and, and to your point, there's a degree of, I think, um, just trying to get like an apply. I, I try to keep it as close to the, column one. I try to keep it as, like, so if there's added conditional column, I'll, instead of conditional column, I'll say added sales amount column. So you can still very quickly scan and see that column is added on that, but what you, I'm just usually modifying it to give it an explicit name inside of the original name of that. So the um, change type becomes changed blank column to date. So it, it should oh, ideally still be readable, but um, otherwise like the, I personally find it like hard to come into like a, a apply set, but if there's nine conditional columns, the only way I can get to that is either open the advanced editor or I have to click on each one to check the formula bar. So it's, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't, you do not want to have a one paragraph column name. It should be short, it should be succinct, and it should be immediately apparent what it's doing by the column name, uh, by, by the That's title right. name. And, and, it and should not say to, fluffy yeah. bunny. Exactly. Yes, it, it, <laughs> so. exactly. But, but adding a little context, I think is totally fine. Just like yeah. instead of adding conditional column, add, added name and then column afterwards. Uh, agreed. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. just be a, a careful thing. As I say, I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. uh, I'm free guilty of my own rename steps. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, and, and like I say, I mean, it's just, I, I know I've seen a lot of people who once you actually teach them that they can rename things, suddenly they're, they're writing stuff that is, it makes sense to them. But when you look back and you're handing it off to someone else to debug later, it's like, okay, now this takes me five times as long. So it's just one of those things <laughs> that we gotta be, gotta be careful. It's like pe teaching people how to use named yep. ranges for formulas in Excel. Uh, they go nuts and then it's like, okay, now I can't figure out what the hell you're doing. So just like I say, all good things, but be careful. The merge queries is, is, is a good call out uh, for sure. Yeah, like, it, it, basically what he's saying is instead of just like from any one of these, you could just do this or you can go reference. Love the reference. And then you merge. Yeah, now you get a so separate step. So now you get step. a second step, and, and exactly, it's not, it's not automatically folding everything back into a unoptimized kind of foldable source. Um, well, and the frustrating yeah. thing is that if you go and you right-click on that source step right now, and you try and add any description to it or anything like that, you can't. Like, you can put your properties in there, but if you put a description in there, I don't believe it actually comes up with a little uh, with a little dialogue. Okay. Oh, actually, it does now. Okay, fair enough. Yep. But, you, but you cannot rename it. Oh, one pro tip that I, I think I did a short, I did a YouTube short on this, but so really annoyingly, um, whenever any, whenever query preview is loading, you cannot rename it. Like if it's in the process of reloading the actual preview of the query, the rename is, is grayed out. Yet I discovered this, it was a happy accident. If you go to properties, while it's still <laughs> yep. loading, you can name it in here, which also is like, why the F can you still name it here? Why would they grade out if it's possible? They, clearly, it's not. It's not a feature limitation because you can give it a new name in the properties menu, but not in the step. That I've had, I've definitely had many times where I need to give this a proper name, but I have to wait 15 seconds for the query to reload from the, the, the data store. So, if you if you add a step, this is your last step before you close and load, but you actually want to give it a proper name. If this is grayed out because the preview is still loading, just go to properties, rename it here to this, and it will uh, rename it and you can click load without having to wait for that query preview to finish processing. But it, yeah. it, it bugs me because it technically is possible and I don't know why they would gray out the rename step. That's one of those, I just work here things. <laughs> right? Yeah, because I, I, yeah. I always just assumed, oh, it's just something about the code can't be processed because of that, but clearly it, it's capable. So somebody in the, Whoever is managing the global master list of the, of the context menu UI thought that that should just be uh, disabled, but it doesn't have to be. They just thought it should be. There you go. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah both of us have, I'm sure, lots of boxes on so many things in Power Query. Um, but yeah, I, I see a little pop up. So let's um, can we redo a delete step. Sadly, there is no control Z in Power Query. <laughs> there is not. Um, there is no control Z. There's no control Y. Um, if you can redo yeah. this, you can redo the deleted step by redoing the deleted step manually. That's your only option, unfortunately. Yeah, the, I will say, so my workaround for that is if, if I'm going to go muck around and change a lot of stuff and I need to save my work, I'm going to right click. I'm going to duplicate that query. I'm going to go mess around and break stuff in here. When I'm done, I go to the advanced editor, copy it, and I bring it, uh, bring it back to the main one. But I think this is basically like this is almost like a git where I'm doing a branch and then and merging. But uh, because there's been times where it's like I break something a bit too much and I've had to close and reopen my workbook because it's faster 
to restart than it is to try to remember exactly what broke and then reverse engineering. But um, just simply duplicating the query and then creating a sandbox to get messy with it before you kind of merge it back in. Like that's how I um, avoid that issue of, oh shoot, I deleted something that I shouldn't have. So I, I took the wrong direction and I need to kind of backtrack five steps. Yep, you or duplicate for backup. Yeah, one or the other, but for sure, I hundred percent agree with you. Do the same thing. Yeah, one, one of the two, yeah. But just this, this is the way to quickly copy your code. Basically, yep. you you have you have a reserved section of that. Um, I do want to continue asking uh, asking some questions, but I'm always horrible about actually promoting and stuff. So, uh, a couple things that we have in front of us here. I'll paste this into the Teams link in just a uh, chat in just a minute. But some links here for all the speaking events that I've done. That's going to have links to the PDF and a uh, list of every topic that I, I talked that I've ever done. I think I'm at 111 now at this point that I've presented that. I'm sure, Ken, you're probably in the hundreds at this point of places you presented, but it's, it's something that I love to do. Um, the online course that's actually on SkillWave, uh, I have a, there's a link to it uh, on my website that takes you to the SkillWave site. Um, I also included a coupon code for any of my um, services and some of the Power BI files and products that I have on my website with a 30% off code. So feel free to use that. But then otherwise, I'll, I encourage you to check out my YouTube channel. I do a recorded video every Tuesday. I do a live stream. Um, Ken's been on one before uh, from what he does, Monkey Tools. I've, at this point, had a good chunk of both all the Microsoft employees involved in Power BI. My biggest guest that I've had so far was Amir, who was the CTO, uh, pretty much of the Azure data platform uh, from Microsoft, who came and talked about fabric um, back in June, and that was a pretty fun honor to have him on my live stream. But we do those every Friday, and it's usually an hour's talk, demo, presentation, or any combination in between of really cool things uh, to learn about Power BI, or Power Platform, or Fabric. Um, and I always encourage people to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I like to try to provide help and support, answer quick questions. Um, if it's more of a technical question that I think has broad application, I'll probably encourage you to post it to the community forums because I can answer it there because other people can then see the solution and it helps the community grow as far as resources that are available. Um, and then last but not least, I want to mention, if I can get the, there you go, QR code to show up. I have a QR code that uh, takes you to a form. It signs you up for my blog and it's your name in a hat. If you're already a member, uh, subscriber to my blog, you just put your name in the hat, but somebody will get their name drawn out and you get some consulting time with me. So you can ask me about DAX, Power Query, uh, anything related to Power BI or the Power Platform or Fabric, um, but you uh, get a chance just to hang, hang out and um, you know pick my brain on some of the expertise that I hope we can provide some help and assistance on. Um, so feel free to sign up for that. Uh, it will, uh, um, like I said, sign you for the blog, but it's uh, free of charge and you can cancel if you want to afterwards. Uh, but it's a, kind of a way to connect and also um, mm -hmm. give a little raffle prize away for people uh, like yourselves who decided to hang out for a bit and uh, listen to some of the cool stuff that I can talk about in Power BI. Um, with that being said, I want to just see if there's any other question. Okay, that was just related to the um, other recording, but because I want to keep this uh, QR code up for a minute, is there, if there's anybody with any other questions, comments, or conversations, please feel free to come off mute um, and uh, we can have a little bit of a chat as we start to wrap up. I already see some uh, pop-ups on my phone for people um, who've uh, submitted, so thank you. Awesome. Well, I don't see any uh, any mics unmuting or anything like that. So sure. why don't we move towards the uh, the wrap up? So I don't know if you've got any other slides that you want to throw in there, Reed, or no? No. Yeah. Feel free to uh, take over the the screen share, and we can uh, go right. from there. All um. Uh, just don't need to do that. We'll we'll anything. we'll leave we'll leave your blog raffle uh, or blog sign up uh, thing up there. That's that's not a problem. Um. So I mean the uh, the general sort of gist of the uh, the thank you on this one is, dude, thanks. Um. This is fantastic. I always learn stuff watching uh, watching the stuff that you bring in here, and um, really appreciate you coming and spending the time with our group to uh, to share what you shared here. Um. For those people who aren't in the know on this one, uh, there is uh, Reed does have a course at Skillwave where he uh, he does a little bit of uh, dashboard work and shows some of the cool tricks here, so you can learn how some of these uh, some of these things actually happen and work. Um, and I think Reed's uh, going there right now, so um, you should definitely uh, definitely check that out. And um, beyond that, uh, the part that I usually end off is to let people know. If you scroll down a little bit more, uh, I think it's uh, one of the there we go. There it is, right in the bottom center. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, um, I will have the recording of this uh, posted within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, once that uh, recording is live, um, I will uh, I will post on the Meetup site to let everybody know that it is there. Um, so you can always go back and, and watch and see some of the things that are there um, as well again. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming. Really uh, glad that you came and spent the time with us this evening. Thanks again, Vareed, for uh, for doing such a great job and, and giving us such an awesome presentation. And uh, again, oh. big uh, thanks to, uh, to Joseph as well, who I think is uh, probably headed out for the day, but uh, for doing our What's New. Um, so, yeah, this has been uh, been fantastic, and we'll catch you all next time. <laughs>